Welcome to this edition of Newsnight with the old man of the clan, Andrew Mwenda, and also CEO of the Independent Magazine. Andrew, um, welcome back. Um, we did have to air a recorded program yesterday, uh, and I did mention you are out of the country, and we did see where you are on TV. Um, but quickly, while you're away, mm -hmm. on Monday the President, while addressing Cabinet, um, mm -hmm. threw away his uh, speech, written speech, and uh, spoke from his heart. A bitterly angry president. How do you know he was speaking also from his mind? Because he said he heart. was speaking from his heart and because he had mm -hmm. felt the pain of Ugandans. Um, that mm -hmm. on his several trips of country, mm -hmm. he's discovered several things. One was the incompetence of government on service delivery, especially mm -hmm. in the education sector, mm -hmm. where he said uh, he has found 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds seated at home uh, because they've been chased from school uh, for not being uh, paying uh, or not government not releasing funds uh, for capitation for mm. their meals or um, for their fees anyway the, the 700 or 7,000 shillings that government mm. sends that doesn't go if it goes it goes late doesn't go to the schools um, incompetence of the Ministry of Health in tackling typhoid and how it could spread um, looking by today's numbers I think about we had about 1,400 cases so far mm. this year uh, investors uh, being mistreated or not being helped at all and having to turn to neighbors f to do business, maybe um, running to Rwanda. He cited one investor who turned to Rwanda after he failed to get business here. Uh, the road sector, he said the roads are so bad because the way bridges are not working. <coughs> the people at the way bridges are being bribed by trucks that are actually overloaded and affecting the quality of our roads. And um, of course that among many other issues, I think there was also something on security. He was a very angry man before his cabinet. Mm. First of all, you know this comes at the, at the end of uh, another cabinet retreat, which me and you attended, <laughs> where President Kagame was so angry. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> they, they shared the script. They, they shared the script. In fact, I found myself in uh, a funny position of having to tell President Kagame, please, these guys have done some job, also recognize it. That has been taken out of context here so, in Uganda and several places. Yes, uh, yes. Saying there is a bitter row between you and the president. Uh, but uh, oh, no, no, no. That is what those who are writing want. They are not writing what happened in the meeting. They, have, they are writing about what they would wish to happen. And they were not in the meeting anyway. And they were not in the meeting. So that, that, uh, uh, that is one. But you could see you were there, President Kagame, getting frustrated that things are not working. And President Yoram Seveni, now you see he's getting frustrated. But let me <coughs> tell you what the two of them share. One, I think that uh, both Museveni and Kagame are victims of their success. How? You see, when Museveni and Kagame came in, one day President Museveni were having dinner at the, uh, at the State House, and he told me, look, this old man Mukwano, one day when the President came, he said there was no soap, and we need to find to get soap here. Yes. And importing it was, exp it was difficult. So Museveni asked for Mukwano to be brought to him. So when they bring Mukwano, I think Mukwano had been a friend of Milton Obote. When the old, this is the President telling me, when the old man entered the President's presence, this is early 1986, he's so scared he thinks they have come to arrest him and they're going to kill him mm. for collaborating with Obote's government. Mm. So when he arrives, Museven says, we don't have soap. How much soap does Uganda need? Mm. And Mukwano says, we need, uh, let's say, 100,000 metric tons. I cannot remember the actual figures, but I have them somewhere in my notes. And then uh, uh, and, and he says, how much are you producing? Mukwano says, only uh, 10,000. What do you need to produce 100,000? Mm. Uh, Mukwano said, I need $5 million. Museven said, give him $5 million. And then he says, you go. So Mukwano goes and they go to the central bank and he picks $5 million. In two years, Uganda was producing 100,000 uh, metric tons of, uh, soap. of soap. In five years, it was 200,000, much more than the president even had Isn't stated. that the problem, that the president no, is micromanaging? I, 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 well, I am coming to this. This yes. is 1986. Yes. So here you have a clear situation of the collapse of the state. So that the president is issuing orders and people obeying and just dishing out money to private investors. The good thing in this case, he gave money to, Mulu, uh, to Mukwano and he, the Things Mokwano met his uh, bargain. And I think he paid back. It was kind of loan, but it the was, way yeah, it was loan. given was so yeah. personal and arbitrary. So when the president told me this story, I realized if M7 can't do that now, because what M7 has successfully done is to reconfigure and reconstruct state institutions. Of course, we always blame him for that there are no institutions. He has not strengthened institutions. But I tell you, government right now cannot easily release that money. There has to be a process. It has to go to UDB. UDB has to approve and all this. By the time the private investor gets it, all these sharks along the value chain would have nibbled a lot of money off it. First and of all, the NRM has become increasingly corrupt. Yes. Everybody wants their cut. But two, power has gotten more institutionalized. Yes. The more they have institutionalized. You see, at that time, power is personalized. 
But although it was personalized, there was still the spirit of collective action, that a, a collective vision, let us rebuild our country. Now, the collective vision has retreated. Why? Because the core of the NRM, if they have not been corrupted and, uh, and have retained their zeal and, uh, and enthusiasm for the national good, the, it, they have been also polluted by so many ordinary civil servants. Right now, the civil service is about half a million. You get it? So there are so many layers of decision making that delay every single thing from happening and actually create opportunities for corruption. But Andrew, here's a system you've set in place. Mm. You have a budget that has been approved, has been approved by, uh, by parliament. Mm. Mm. You know this amount of money has been allocated to UPE and USE. Mm. And it's not being released. And, 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 and you're wondering why. Mm. Um, in one case scenario, um, I think Transparency International did a report on Wakiso. Mm. And money for Wakiso schools was getting to the schools at the end of the term. And you wonder, why, but, how but, do they but, expect but, a school to operate mm. if the money, the but little let, money the government is releasing is getting to a school at the end of the term? Here the president has to deal with the fact of, uh, Nassal is a, a very good lady, the current permanent secretary yes. in the Ministry of Education. She's yes. a nice lady. But that is a failure on her part. Because let me tell you, I want you tomorrow to go to Keith McCannis's office. Yes. Keith McCannis is very clear. He has his print out. On the actual day, money is supposed to be released for the quarter. The Ministry of Finance releases money, they put it in account. The question is, if you're permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education, why does that ministry money delay? You, well, then we can go to the ministry and find that the money is immediately released. Because remember that the, a lot of this money is not even necessarily because money for education is released, primary schools is really di released directly to districts. Yes. What is happening at the district level? Yes. Why are district officials not releasing this Isn't money? Isn't this now the bureaucratic process? Don't we know the schools that are actually taking in students uh, under government know? process? What's wrong with the ministry the releasing Minister money finance? straight to the bank accounts of these schools so that the schools can actually manage this resource? Okay. You're You've making just another mistake. Yes. Uh, the break in, Morris, in, do you think that if that money was released directly to the schools. Yes. Do the head, the head teachers in those schools have the incentive to release that money to students? Maybe the head teacher may want to release it first, go trade with it in the local market. Once he has made his profit, then he takes it back to the school. You see that. So there's a breaking system in the system. Let me tell you what the solution should yes. be rather than com uh, complain about issues. Because in Uganda, we have a lot of complaining. We have very little of solution making. I personally believe that the government of Uganda has proven itself to be very effective and efficient at resource allocation. So we will call that the allocative function of the state. True. But when we come to the implementation function of the state, we have found the state to be wanting and weak. As far as possible, in those areas where the private sector can substitute the state, I personally think government should sell the schools and get out and leave them to the private sector. So that the state retains its role. You see, for government of Uganda to finance education, it does not have to provide it. There is a serious mindset problem in Uganda. People think that if government has to provide uh, to finance education, it must provide it. If it is going to finance you to start at school, it must own the school. It doesn't have to. I own private schools. Gov I, uh, government can send kids there and pay yes, for them. Yes. So what I am saying is that the most important challenge facing Uganda, especially because of the rapid elaboration of the education sector, to increase in, in order to expand and increase access to education, government of Uganda needs to preserve its institutional competencies. How do you preserve them? By getting out of provision and restricting your role to two things, school inspection yes. and financing. Yes. Government should build effective capabilities for inspection. It already has ultra effective capabilities for allocation. And the structure is already this in place. Money, yes, yes, let this money be given to private schools. Let parents get coupons or vouchers, whatever you call them, so that they can, a, a parent who cannot afford to ch send a child to a private school will have a coupon or a, a voucher and they can go with this voucher to a private school and pay fees. The problem we are facing is a mindset problem that Ugandans cannot understand, that you can separate the financing function of education and the provision function of education. Right. Education can be provided by the private sector but financed by the state. All right, Andrew, we must end it here. Um, this is something we may have to come to because we've just tackled no, education. Tomorrow we should deal we with the issue of the overall government performance and Fantastic. how we can restructure state institutions, you understand, to ensure that they are able to deliver public goods and services efficiently to citizens through financing, yes. not necessarily through provision. Well said. That was Newsnight.